Okay, I'm going to go. Okay. And you're good whenever. All right. Thanks, guys. Well, guys, welcome to the, the session here on building your lean case for change. Let me uh, invite you all, if you could, unmute. Let's just have a quick conversation here. I'm, I'm primarily interested. I want to make sure I understand what, you know, kind of which particular topic you want to look on in terms of the case for change. Is it planning? Is it uh, uh, lean accounting or that kind of thing? So if we could, let's take a moment. Let everybody just kind of say what, what you're here for, and then we'll jump right into it. Kyle, why don't you start us off? Yeah, um, so uh, at the Lean Accounting Summit, you did a presentation on uh, planning, uh, doing away with the traditional budgeting process and going to a rolling planning. So that's what I'm interested in. Okay, all right. Um, Terry, you want to jump next? You're unmuted. Um, I'm relatively new to Lean Accounting, and I know there's a lot of process changes that I'd like to... Uh, look into and trying to, from what I understand, you might be able to help me plan that and get others on board. Sure, sure. The process I'm going to take you through is going to focus, uh, and it'll, it'll take you through a process you can apply with just about any part of lean plan, of, of going to lean. So yeah, we don't do budgets, so that, good. But we'll, you know, take what I can learn out of here and try to apply it. All right, good. Darlene, you want to jump in? Sure. So um, I'm in finance, not accounting, but I'm always curious to learn more. And I think the lean accounting is something I haven't had a lot of exposure to, but I'm mostly interested in anything planning and um, lean planning, if you will, then. So just here to learn. Okay, great, great. Maria, you have anything else to add there? I know you're from VSP as well. Yeah, similar to Darlene, I'm looking forward to the lean plan, learning more about lean planning, but also I think I'm most interested in change management and how do we um, execute on that successfully. Well, good. Well, we have a lot of lessons kind of woven into that because that's that's the important part. Uh, Jim, did you want to say anything? Jim Huntsinger is joining us. Jim's the, uh, the founder of uh, the Lean Accounting Summit and all around good guy uh, has been doing this a lot. Jim, do you have anything you want to add to the group before we get started? Uh, no, I just want to certainly sit in and just kind of hear the discussion, conversation, and and listen and learn myself. Great, great. Jim's been a great light in the lean world. So, and then we've got Skylar, who's also with Lean Frontier. Skylar's our our wizard behind the scenes, making everything happen. And so we want to thank Skylar. Skylar, you any any word words of wisdom for the group? words of wisdom, but I will remind you that um, you will receive a recording for this um, within 24 to 48 hours. So just be on the lookout for, for another email from me for that. Yep. And everybody kind of be aware, we also have some other participants who couldn't be here at this particular time, but they're eagerly waiting the, uh, the uh, recording as well. So uh, let me jump to that. I'm going to switch over and start sharing screens and get into a presentation. I'm going to pull up this. Now, also, in addition to this presentation, um, the, the presentation I'm about to go through with you was shared with the entire group, as well as some handouts. And I'll show you the handouts as we, uh, as we get, begin to work those uh, as we go through as a group. So let me kind of jump into that. You know who I am. I've spoken a couple of times at the Lean Accounting Summit. I've been doing the, the whole planning forecasting area for about 20 years now. So uh, a lot of work and background in this area. Little opening remarks. When you think about the difference between a typical environment versus a lean environment, on the left-hand side of the screen, you see in a typical environment, it's it's a, a make and sell kind of environment. You think about what service you're gonna offer, what product you're gonna make, and you push that to the marketplace. It's, it's out there for sale and the customer's persuaded to buy that often through discounts and multiple ways of promotion. But it's really the best way to think about it, it is a push system. You're pushing your product or service to the customer. If you flip around and look at the lean production system, primarily uh, fostered by Toyota, it takes a different view. It is a pull system. It starts with the customer and the customer pulls what they're looking for. 
that pull against your production, your services, and against your resources. So it's really, the, in this, is the difference between lean and non-lean. Lean focuses on customer pull where uh, traditional manufacturing, traditional service companies focus on a, on a push type approach. Now, when you take and move that into the finance organization to apply those same kind of principles, you know, uh, uh, Tegucci Ono, who was the, the, the engineer behind the, the Toyota production system, you know, began to define a lot of things. And, and really the goal of a lean enterprise is to better serve the customer by elimination of waste. He, he really wanted to focus on, on what the customer needed. Anything else was considered waste. When you apply that specifically to accounting, in accounting what we're trying to eliminate is waste in the financial processes. Uh, and there's there's some nuances that we could get into about lean accounting or accounting for lean, but but that's beyond the scope of this. We'll talk about that later in the Q&A if we have time. We take and apply that to any area. The workshop I've designed for you is set up to kind of work you through that. So I'm going to take you through a couple things. I'm going to take you through some change management processes first, focusing on two main tools. Rick Maurer's Cycle for Change, which sets up change in the overall context. And then I'm going to go very specifically into one, the first court trial of that, which is making the case for change. And we're going to use a tool called the change formula to do that. And most of the, I'll lay out in the first part, those, uh, the first third, I'll kind of lay out those two constructs and then we'll get into actually using them. In the second part, we're going to document the case for change um, and, and, and really start applying it specifically to the planning function and use the waste worksheet to begin to identify waste in the current system. If you were trying to do something other than the planning function, if you're doing uh, 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 manufacturing or if you're doing service costing or if you're doing any of the other functions, if it counts payable, any of those things, you can apply these same waste elimination techniques I'm going to show you to those with a slightly different change. And I'll try to point that out as I go through. And then ultimately, uh, we need to describe the vision of what we're getting rid of and what we're trying to go to. And then the third part, we talk about how do you get started and how do you overcome the resistance change. So change management is kind of embedded throughout the, the entire process here as we go forward. Rick Maurer is an author, wrote a number of, uh, he's, he's a change management guru. He's written a number of books about that, and we we're fortunate enough to have, been, have worked with him over the past. He has a book called Beyond the Wall of Resistance, where he presents this concept of the cycle of change. Originally, it comes from the Gestalt cycle, and basically, it, it, to me, it's a very good way of thinking about it. In all our organizations, if you think about this, this uh, kind of green arrows you see around the screen, they almost create kind of a clock face. And everything starts at, at kind of the zero hour up at the 12 o'clock. They're the kind of the midnight. And most organizations are in what Maurer describes as they're in the dark. And they're in the dark in that they're, they're just doing their business. They're just going about their ordinary operation and they don't really see anything. So what happens to begin the cycle of change is you move from being unaware of anything to seeing a challenge. The move from 12 o'clock to 3 o'clock is really about seeing the challenges. And then when we focus on seeing the challenges, what's really happening there is we see an opportunity or a threat. Uh, threat's pretty easy to see. Uh, competitors are merging or we're having supply chain problems. There's something happening in your environment that, that is a threat. If I'm in the healthcare world, the pandemic is certainly a huge challenge in terms of what, what we see out there. And so I emphasize both they're both opportunities can be seized or threats can be defended against those are the challenges and so getting that recognition on seeing the challenge is the start of the change process in terms of what's out there and what that usually leads is to some kind of, of formal documentation or formal declaration that there is a need for change in terms of a case for change which is what we're going to be talking about mostly here today now let me take you on around the wheel real quickly so you make sure you keep up with how this fits in because it's important when we come back to how we harvest the change from that kind of three o'clock that you see on your on your wheel there we move down to the five o'clock five o'clock is getting getting started this is from going beyond the point where you see the change to getting a project funded getting some kind of investment made where you're going to step in and actually start or start to do something to address it could be implementing a new computer system could be launching a new service or product it's, it's there's there's some initial work to get things going and get that approved that gets you started and then there's a lot of heavy lifting installing systems revamping processes there's, there's getting that project flushed out to the point where you're ready to use it across the organization. And this takes us up to the rollout stage. 
Now, it's important to think about when you think about what's all happening is kind of the emphasis and the energy. Maurer talks a lot about energy, and it's real important. You've done all these things to see that there's a problem, and then you've moved around to that, that wheel, and, you, and, you, it, and everybody's doing a lot to get things happening and getting ready to roll out. But what usually happens at rollout is you see a big shift. And that if you brought in consultants or you brought in special teams, when they get ready to roll out, they're also simultaneously packing up to go someplace else. You know, once they get the roll out, they're declaring victory and moving on. And if you think about it, where's most of the rest of the organization when you get right up to that seven o'clock spot, when you get ready to roll out, where's most of the rest of the organization? And what we find is the majority of the rest of the organization is usually all the way back up there in the dark. In many cases, a large part of the organization is not even aware that we're responding to challenges, or they may be vaguely aware of it, but they're not like in tune with the specifics. So one of the hard things about change and the reason why in many cases we get to roll out, we lose momentum is the fact that we have the vast majority of the resource the organization haven't been coached and counseled and communicated with and brought around so that they're, they're ready for the rollout and they're not anticipating the rollout. It gets sprung upon them. All of a sudden, their world's going to change. And they've got, to, they've got to rapidly adjust to this new way of thinking when instead a better way would have been have we've been communicating status all the way around as we moved around that wheel and moved around from, from there to where, where we're at there to where we get ready to roll out. Once you get to roll out, a very critical stage is moving from kind of the seven o'clock up to nine o'clock, moving from, in terms of the rollout, moving from getting started with the rollout all the way around to where you've actually got the system fully deployed, the new process, the new procedure, and you're doing it in the new way, and you're actually getting results. In many cases, this is where the true return on investment actually is, gets deployed and actually comes in. When you moved from rollout into getting results, how do you get there to, to you know, you, when you made the investments, when you hired the consultants, when you bought the new system, whatever you did, you spent money with an expected return on investment. You don't get the return unless the rollout is successful and you actually drive the new behaviors that get the new results. And so a real critical part that not near enough companies spend attention to is how do I make sure that I get results? And so as a result, what usually happens in many cases is the, the project's exhausted, it loses energy, you have to try to figure out how to get it going again. And some projects never ever get going again. They die on the vine. You, you put it in, but it never really got deployed, never really got used and it dies on the vines. And even though management emphasizes stresses, we really should use this. In many cases, it just kind of fizzles out. And you struggle for a while to try to do that. And that could go six months, a year, two, three years, some period of time trying to struggle with. But eventually, whatever happens, wherever you got to in the results, whether they were fully realized or not realized at all or somewhere in between, after some period of time, this thing gets up to 11 o'clock when it's, it's kind of time to move on. And what happens at 11 o'clock is what happens regardless of, of the state that you're in, that slips back up into the status quo and the status quo is in the dark. It's just the way we are. It's just the way we do things. So think about your organizations as we, how do we move them from where they are to see an opportunity to go all the way through and successfully harvest it and not get stuck with just moving on in terms of what's out there. Now, today's exercise, we're going to focus very heavily on that first quartile, the from move the, in the dark to seeing the challenge. So we're going to take that, that very top corner there and, and tackle that, making a compelling case for change. Now, in doing the making the compelling case for change, we're going to use another tool, which is called the change formula, also called the Gleacher formula. It's very simple, easy to use, and I like this a lot. You can use it for any change management approach. It's a simple formula. D times V times F has got to be greater than R. In this situation, D stands for dissatisfaction, V for vision, F the first steps, greater than R, R is the resistance to change. Now, any of the first three, dissatisfaction, vision, or known first steps, any of those first three are zero, what's going to happen in the formula? If any of those are zero, you're not going to have change happen. You've got to have all three with positive values. And the higher you can make each of those positive values, the more motivation you have for change. Flip side is, since this is a greater than equation, you're trying to make the, 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 uh, right, the uh, left side of the equation there greater than the right side of the equation. What you're trying to do is flip that so you can in, make change happen by increasing those three factors or reducing the resistance to change. And there's always resistance to change, even if it's resistant just to inertia or, you know, a body in Newton's law, a body in motion stays in motion, a body at rest stays in rest. 
the body of resistance is going to stay doing what it's doing. And so it takes a very concrete positive action to actually change that and move that in terms of moving forward. So we're going to use this formula as we break down and, and move forward in terms of what's out there. That takes us into a second part of our, uh, our discussion, which is really kind of uh, documenting the case for change. And this is where we're going to start actually everybody doing some work and start kind of building the process here. Okay. First thing I want you to focus on, uh, and if you can, I'd like you to unmute and we can have a bit of a discussion here. Your worksheet P, you, you should have gotten a set of uh, slides, which is a, is a PDF of the slide deck that we're going through and a PDF of some worksheets. This is worksheet P um, that is really focused on what is the purpose of what we're trying to do. And in many organizations, you don't really focus on, on and lots of times, what are we trying to tackle? So if you could pull up your worksheet P, um, and let's just kind of document that. If you think about planning and what you're currently doing today, who is the customer of the planning function? You could just unmute anybody. Kind of give me who do you guys think is our customers when we think about planning? Who are we doing that for? Well, we're doing it for a roll up to our corporate leadership. Um, they're doing it for you know, internal and external constituents, bondholders, whatever. So some information to the outside parties, some information for internal management. Right. Yeah, yeah. And we see that a lot when we've got uh, when we've got different uh, constituents out there that uh, that there may be multiples that are out there. What other thing? Other thoughts? If we're talking planning, like from a budgeting perspective, I'd say, you know, we're mostly focused on um, our board and our management team. Mm -hmm. And in your situation, what is that, that budget approval? Is that that formal authorization to spend money or a formal agreement to be in the plan? What, what does approval really mean? Uh, they definitely approve the final budgets, you know, starting with revenue and all the costs, you know, down to what EBITDA mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. for the next year, um, for five years, five-year plan usually. Okay. These questions I'm asking, is it comfortable to answer this question or is it a little bit hard to answer these questions? You think about why do we plan? I guess I'm a little confused on what we're, what you're referring to when you're talking about planning. Because like I said, we don't do budgeting. I mean, we have other plans. Do you, do you have a strategic plan, Terry? Um, yeah, I, I guess. I, okay. Yeah. Do you have a sales and operations plan or something that, that the plant or the facilities are using for short-term planning? Mm, nothing formal that I'm aware of. Okay, how does the plant know what to make and when to make it? Uh, it it's a, when the, when the POs come in. Okay, so you're, you're, you're a custom shop? Yes, we're a okay. manufacturer, sorry. Okay. Yeah, we're so, manufacturing, but, so the, the, as the um, orders come in, that's when we make the product. But you're a manufacturer to order, you don't have stock products that you're making. We try not to, yes. Yeah. And the manufacturer order, you're going to be clean, a little bit more toward a lean approach because it's the customer's orders that you're really responding to. Correct. In, in terms of what's out there. But how, when you think about it, how do they decide how many people they need to, they need to employ? Hmm. In terms of how, how many workers, how many machinists, that kind of thing. Well, I guess based on backlog. That could be based on backlogs. It's usually based on some estimate of what they think the workload is going to be. Right. Could be backlog, could be basically historical orders. You know, they, they've known that, yeah, I know I've got this many in house, but I know it typically runs this thing in the fall. So For even if you, yeah. yeah, even if you don't have a budget, there's typically something that's guiding management as to what, what's out there. And, and in the beyond budgeting world that I've spent the last kind of 20 years helping guide here in North America and working with my colleagues over in Europe, there's always some kind of planning that's going on in terms of what's out there. It's just in many cases, when you think about the way we, we formalize that, 
in a lot of situations becomes very, very cumbersome. The, the actual process of putting it into a budget. If I take the, the previous example where we have a budget and we approve it each year, what does the approval really mean? It's usually, when, when I ask you guys to think about a process that we're trying to make lean, it's really, really important to understand why are we doing this and what's who's the customer of this and why are we doing it and what do they think about it? What's the purpose of the process? Does it add value? And what kind of business questions does it help answer? And what else do we need to know about kind of the process in terms of what's out there? In, in a lot of situations, we're, we in many businesses, we do things because we've kind of always done those things. We've presumed we inherited a situation where a process was being run and we step in and just keep running it without ever stepping back and saying, you know, how well does this really achieve what we're trying to do? The benefit that, uh, I don't know, if you go back and study the lean, the Toyota production system and study what they did there, one of Ono's most valuable techniques was called the Ono Circle, which was basically a situation where he'd draw a circle on the ground and you would sit and watch and just watch the process and watch what was happening and try to deeply understand you know, what was happening, why was it happening, what was going on, to really understand if there are ways to make it better, understand if there were waste in the system and being able to identify kind of what was out there. And one of the things I'm going to take you guys through here in just a minute is that same kind of process looking at the planning system in terms of what's out there. So in your situation, Terry, we really got to think through what, is, what do we do, what kind of planning do we do even though we don't have a budget in, in terms of what's out there? Uh, when you hear people talk about we do this to meet bank rules and everything, your corollary to that is if, we, if we're not doing, if we don't have a budget, how are we meeting any kind of bank, you know, bank requirements? Because obviously if you, if you have a bank, I mean, we, we have many beyond budgeting companies that have bank requirements, but budgeting is not one of them because the banks have learned that that's not what they're really after. The budget was a surrogate for what they were really after. And if you can get to what they're really after, there's a much more effective way of providing that to them, which makes them much happier. Okay. Important works first works you guys if you can fill out in terms of if you're going to improve your planning process, it's real important to understand who the customers of that are and what they're really wanting it to do. If you attended my session uh, earlier at the Lean Accounting Summit, we got into that uh, we got into that quite a bit. And uh, you saw in the planning process I use this kind of a approach to really talk about what people were trying to do and typically with planning, they would start with a mission statement or strategic plan of where we're trying to go. And then they would do the six planning uh, the processes, five of which are planning. I set targets, where are we trying to go? I align incentives, what are we gonna pay people to reach those targets? We agree on the action plans, what steps do we have to take to reach those targets? We allocate resources, how much resource do we have to take those action plans? And because no part of the organization does it together, our fifth step is coordinating all those plans. Those are all kind of the planning processes and that created a budget. Now, Terry, in your situation, do you see those same five things in terms of what you guys are trying to do? Uh, do, do you all have targets at your company? Well, uh, we have a company-wide target of days to ship. Okay. You know, that, that comes to mind. Um, so what's interesting about that, that's almost a customer satisfaction. Your know, days to ship is kind of how quickly can we serve the customer, right? Yeah, it's our metric. Mm -hmm. Okay. Is there a financial target of any type? Not really. I mean. Yeah. It, not, you may not have anything explicit, but nearly all businesses have a financial target of I got to make money. Well, sure. Yeah, it, it's, it's almost kind of there are some de facto targets that all of us face. If we're losing money, we're, we're not guaranteed to stay in business. So all, all businesses that are sustainable have to make some kind of profit. Right. So there's almost, but, but, but he doesn't state, you know, all right, it's we're in coming to the end of 2021. Let's make sure we're four hundred thousand dollars in black. You know, there's. You Correct. Don't really have targets like that. Yeah, he's not managing to the financial target, and that's where a lot of people get in trouble. They try to manage to a financial target okay. uh, because the reachability of a financial target is usually based on a whole bunch of assumptions. The thing that we all miss in budgeting and planning and so forth, budgets are almost exclusively based on a whole bunch of assumptions, many of which you aren't even stated. You know, presumptions about what what products and services you're offering, what the competition's offering. 
uh, you know, there's just a whole lot of things when you really think about planning as it's constructed. And what I try to point out when I go through this slide and thing is if I separate these into different things, I find out that many cases, these, these objectives, when all meshed together, become very difficult to, to achieve. And if I pull them apart and separate them into their respective part and think about it individually, an annual budget's not a really good way to tackle that. So if I'm looking at targets and rewards and I'm trying to prove that, I really would want my, my targets and rewards to really be something that the that people would set on themselves. I wouldn't need to have the boss tell people what to do. The people would say, what do we think is possible? We want to be the best. We want to beat our competition. So, but what is, what do we think is possible and, and them aspire to something? Because if, if they're, if the workers are inspired by them, if they're self-imposed targets, nobody's pushing them. They're basically trying to, to, you know, they're self-motivated to kind of tackle that. If I come down and I look at the planning and forecasting, what I see in many cases, Planning and forecasting, which often gets caught up in traditional companies in trying to hit those targets, and you often see forecasts that always hit the targets. A real forecast should be a realistic view of just where do we think it's actually going to run out, not in not tainted by a target. Of, you know, the forecast should be where we think we're going, not necessarily where we want to. Because if we if we don't have a real good picture of where we think we're going, we don't know how on course or off course we are. So the, the best forecast is a very simple, just linear projection of where we're trying to go. And I can look at that almost entirely. It's almost as if I'm sailing a ship and I can see how fast the ship's sailing and the weather conditions we're in. And I can do a linear projection of where that ship's you know, going to go. Now, is that going to be where I want it to be? No, it's not. If it's not, then I know I got to make some changes. I got to change the rudder, change the direction. I got to change the speed. I've got to do something to steer the ship back to where we want to be. So if I separate those two things, I find a better way of tackling it. From a resource allocation, instead of doing it budgets, we do it once a year in advance. The resource allocation really needs to be much more, much more frequent with that, much more fluid than that based on really what's happening. If I'm trying to make a, a change and trying to make a shift, I'm going to need more resources to tackle that. If I'm making a shift, there's likely going to be other places that I'm moving away from that are going to need less resources. So a much more dynamic, uh, real-time allocation of resources gives me a much better way to, to kind of adjust for that. In terms of measuring and control, rather than setting that once a year in advance and trying to, to track to whether or not I'm hitting a budget, you know, I'm much better off if I have real-time real measures that look at, at relatively what I'm doing and relative to what we're being asked to do. So if you can take and pull this thing apart, you find much better ways to, to tackle that in terms, of, in terms of what's out there. Okay? Um, thoughts on that from anybody? Anybody got comments on that? Or does it make sense? Okay, everybody's being kind of quiet today. Let's, okay, let's, let's jump in a little bit. And let me give you kind of one other kind of key touchstone to talk to, and then I'll, I'm going to get some into some of the exercises here, some more of the worksheets. When you really think about it, what you're really trying to do is you're trying to move to where your five-year vision says uh says we're headed would you tell another word we're trying to move to where the strategic plan says we need to go um and so in many cases your strategic vision is is uh, in a different place in terms of in terms of what's out there it sets what we're trying to do and what we're trying to move okay um as we try to shift and, and take that that vision, it often kind of gives us the the approach in terms of of where we're trying to move to in terms of what's out there. So if you've got a strategic plan, use that to help you know, you know kind of lay out where you're trying to get to. And what the strategic plan always reminds me is there's always a place that we're trying to get to that's different than the place we're in. And it's really the ship analogy works really well here, where our company is really a collection. Uh, it's a ship based on thousands of decisions we made in the past. Where you're going to locate, what equipment you're going to have, what what people you've 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 brought on board, and so forth. You're the ship in the lower right hand corner. Your strategic plan paints a vision of where you're trying to get to, and that where you're trying to get to is usually a faster, sleeker, better way to do that. And so all businesses are constantly in this move of converting from the ship in the lower left to the ship on the upper right. And that's what we're trying to transform and move into. So keep that in mind that the strategic plan always gives us a vision of that. And, and we need to build a process that has us always thinking about that and always shifting in terms of what's out there. 
Let's talk about uh, the change equation and jump into dissatisfaction, because if you're building the case for change, again, focusing on that upper right-hand quadrant, is it, it generally starts with dissatisfaction in terms of what's out there. And we've got a lot of material. There's a lot of been written and discussed about dissatisfaction with budgeting and planning. One tool I want you guys to use is Worksheet W, which is the first worksheet in the, uh, in the stack that's out there. So if you think about Worksheet W, what we're focusing on is the seven ways that were initially identified by uh, Taguchi Ono, uh, added with an eighth waste added by Womack and Jones. The waste basically are MUDA, different types of, of things that, that, that we want to try to eliminate. Defects, overproduction for items not needed, inventories, waiting for the processing, unnecessary processing, move, unnecessary movement, transport of people, uh, transport of goods, waiting, unbalanced workflows, and those are the seven initial ways. And the eighth one identified by Womack and Jones was it's not fit for purpose in terms of what's out there. So what I'd like you to do is kind of think through, let's take a moment and uh, let you think through that a little. I'll give you about 60 seconds to just jot down on your worksheet, different one. And then as a group, I'd like to kind of, kind of go through that. So um, let's take a minute, see how we're doing time-wise. Just take a minute, if you can, think through your current planning process and think about the, the things that are in that process. Now, Terry, yours, since you don't have a budgeting process, think about just generally what you guys are doing with planning. Is that clear for everybody? Yes. Thank you. Okay, everybody kind of unmute there so you can be easy for you to, to chat here. The first one I think is pretty easy when we think about what are defects in our defects in our current planning process? What comes to mind when I say defects? Hey, Steve, it's Darlene. Um, and, just curious because for us, this to me feels very manufacturing based mm -hmm. and we are a service industry. so. Maybe you can help us um, bridge that gap there. Yeah, uh, think about, the, because we're applying this to a finance function, right? We're applying this to the, the accounting shop, the finance shop. When you think about defects in the budget, what would, what, what's the analogy for a defect in the planning process? So one thing that immediately comes to mind that kind of always shocks me is, how many times, how many of you guys put out a budget and you get it absolutely right the first time? You know, if, if I'm in a manufacturing analogy, I want to do it right the first time. How many of you guys do the budget right the first time? And by that, I mean, you ask for a budget submission, it comes in, it's golden, it's approved, it's perfect. Has that ever happened to anybody? Almost never. never. <laughs> Almost never done it. I think it's the understatement of the world. I, uh, I get great uh, consternation and levity at the same time when I read the APQC, the American Productivity Quality Center. They publish best practices in lots of different places and they metric and they, they rank things into quartiles. Okay. And the best practice quartile for the number of budget revisions is three to four. If you do three, if you have three to four cycles of rework, in budgeting, that's considered a best practice. It amazes me we can have that much waste, that much back and forth. I've seen people go up back and forth seven, eight times. Every time you send that budget back, it's a reject. It's a, you know, so so the definition of a DJ, it got inspected and rejected. And so so that's a, that to me is the perfect example of Muda or waste in the in the process in ter in terms of what's out there. Uh, others others are more mundane. And you think about we're dealing with lots of data. So if I put out a schedule for somebody to do, but I didn't, the headcount numbers are not right. You know, if I'm putting out, you know, I want to, I want you to plan your headcount, but I'm I'm sending information out that's out of date, that's changing. You look at if you look at uh, production. If we were trying to produce the budget as a instrument, as a report, how many defects would we have in it? 
if we're using Excel spreadsheets, and this is a place a lot of people get in real, real trouble. If we use Excel spreadsheets, you know, most statistics will tell you that most spreadsheets have three to four errors. Uh, and, and some are big, some are small. Sometimes the errors are really, really get us. But the biggest problem with using spreadsheets for doing planning is the fact it's not a control environment. It, it's not, it, it's great for a personal one person, but once I move beyond that and start handing it around and letting different people change the formulas, it's highly prone to error in terms of what's out there and it requires constant checking and constant reworking in terms of what's out there. So those are examples when we go through, in, in it, 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 uh, we're applying this to budgeting planning, you could apply it to power, accounts payable processing, you could apply it to just about anything, you could apply it to month end reporting, and you'd look for the kind of things that, that you know, are defective in terms of, of kind of what's out there. If I shift to number two, overproduction, what would be examples of the analogy for overproduction items that, uh, that you know, that we're not needing? What, what are we prone to overproduce when we do budgets? That'd be reports that aren't even looked at. It could be reports not not looked at. It also could be the the big one is detail, excessive detail. In many cases, uh, there's not a good understanding of what's the right level of detail in terms of what's out there. Um, that may be an example of the uh, of the the. Uh, uh, Number three there, I mean, uh, number four, over-processing in terms of what's out there. So when, when you think about it, 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 when you look at just the budget process and you, and, and you, you think about if you're, if you're passing out worksheets to people, how, the album act, it, it, just the physical process that we go through to compile all these things makes it a very, very cumbersome process. Um, other examples, guys, of overproduction. Anybody else? One area for us, and I know you've helped us with this, you know, trying to focus on a relative metric versus a static budget. So we do put a lot of time, and I'm thinking of SGNA for us, but we put a lot of time into budgeting for SGNA, and we have this static dollar number that we march towards. You know, we we do it five months before the year even started. So it gets stale so quickly. So it's all that time we put into that number that, you know, with by, by the time the year starts, it can be a, an old number. So that it, feels wasteful to me. It, it, it can't, it, it, what's, what's, what's scary to me, Darlene, about that specific example, it's a really, really good one. It's wasteful in two different ways. It could be too big a number. It also could be too little of a number. Right. You know, we sort through it. It's just the, the the picking a fixed target can be hugely wasteful because it's only good based on a thousand assumptions you had to make about what's the right number that I need. And there's so and many moving parts there; it's impossible to predict that. I think. And it can be wasteful for for the whole year because you keep going towards that target. So well, you, each yeah. month, you know, you could be doing doing what you really don't want to do, but you don't realize it. So that's a good example of the, of the variance explanation process. You know, there, there, there's a constant, the, the process that we've put in place to check on that number. You know, people have got to explain why they're not on that number. And we have a management accountants asking for those explanations and people trying to come back to those explanations. When the explanation may have been it was the wrong number to begin with because it's based on assumptions that turned out to be wrong. So we keep focusing on the number, not the underlying causes of the number, what's driving the number in terms of what's out there. Right. Um, and it also does a thing that we're really bad at in finance in that we lock into, um, we lock into periods. I mean, when you think about it, if you really believed in planning, and I'm, I'm, I've, I've talked to people of all different stripes, have all different opinions. A lot of people say, I really, really feel like we need to plan. And I don't, I don't have a problem with planning, but if you really need to plan, why wouldn't you do it continuously? Why do I do this on a once a year basis? You know, and really think about it. To me, it's much more back to my ship analogy. It's much more like steering a ship. And I, I need to steer the ship constantly. You know, 
I need to constantly know where we think we're headed and are we getting there? And if not, we're constantly making, you know, small corrections to keep us coming back to course. And so when you, when you begin to think through it, what, what we found is when you look at the traditional processes, there's just lots of ways um, that, that they don't. If I look at number seven there, waiting. It, how long does it take to do annual budgets in most places? Best practices is two months. Worst practice is six, eight months or longer. Well, why does it take so much time? It really doesn't take that much time to fill out those numbers, right? But it's because there's a tremendous, tremendous amount of waiting. And some of that waiting is simply waiting because the numbers are, you know, the underlying assumptions are changing. So I'm waiting to get a little closer to the time. Well, even if no matter what I'm doing, I'm still not at the time. I need a process that, that allows me to make the decisions closer to when those changes happen, which would, would argue for a continuous process, not a once a year annual process. So, you know, that, that's what we're trying to get to in terms of the worksheets is, is, is what are the different ways and, you know, kind of unnecessary tackling in terms of what's out there. Okay. Steve, yeah. I have a question related to that. Okay. Isn't part of that solved by ongoing rolling forecasts? Well, let's talk about that real quickly, because when you say ongoing rolling forecasts, give me your definition of ongoing rolling forecasts. Updating the uh, forecasts on an ongoing basis. In our case, it's monthly. Okay. Um, for the next uh, several periods, in our case, we do uh, up to a two-year rolling forecast. And so as actuals come in on a monthly basis, we should be adjusting our forecast based on one, the actuals that we saw, and two, any changes to the future that would impact historical trend. Do we change the targets any when we update the forecast? No. We don't change the targets. That's that's good. That's good, because you want to keep that. Thing. If you update the forecast, all that's really doing is giving you a new picture of where you think you're headed. Right. What typically needs to happen is whenever you update forecasts, they're usually trigger says, okay, at what point are we off course a point to where we need to update our action plan? If, if I think about it, if my forecast tells me where I really think I'm going, if it's, un, if it's unaffected by the target, in other words, it's a realistic projection of where we think we're going. So, it, so the target is, is a where we want to go. And what brings us from where we're going to where we want to go? Well, it's, it's different action, but we start doing something differently. We start taking actions to influence and move us to improve or close a gap or what have you. So what typically ought to happen in a continuous improvement environment, I'm using a rolling forecast, there also has to be a kind of a continuous looking at action plans to see if they're going to be adequate to bring us into where we really want to go. And Steve, that would require you to work back with the business, right? Because yeah. finance can have a rolling forecast and decide, oh, wow, our target, our original plan is good or bad, whatever. Um, we can do all our analysis and do, you know, come up with the variances and decide we're headed in a certain direction. But unless we work back with the business, we can't really validate that, right? What, the, what you're getting to the validation is hopefully they've got your numbers have got credibility and you've been able to work with them. So when they when you produce a forecast, they actually believe it because they know it's un, it's non curved. It's it's it doesn't bend. Any, it shows where you really think they're going to wind up. But then that, that immediately says at some point, as long as where I'm going to wind up is still going to get to within the noise of the target. In other words. It's still, you know, there's a variation that goes on. And as long as I'm still within the band to get to where I want to go, I'm okay. At some point, if I'm drifting too far below or going too far above, I might want to change the action plan. So if you have a parameter that says, if we're too far below or too far above, adjust the action plan. So if I'm too far below, it's, it would call for the action plans, which would require, as you described, require a meeting with the operating people to say, hey, we're drifting to here. We need to, to, to do more take advantage of it. Or if you were going too high, hey, we're overshooting here. We need to at least alert people or we can pull back on some of those investments and redeploy it somewhere else. Either one of those things, again, requires a close coordination on the action plans. Absolutely got to got to be talking to the operating people because they're the ones who actually implement the action plans. They, they develop them and implement them. So yeah, it requires a close kind of coordination in terms of what's out there. 
but they also, in many cases, have a very uh, vested interest in, uh, they have a very vested interest in terms of what's out there. Steve, I'm sorry, I just want to let you know I'm losing my access. I keep. I don't know why that is. You, can you talk now, darling? Okay, let me uh, let me keep going here because I gotta I gotta make sure we kind of finish this up. So, the MUDA workshop there is to fill out to help you kind of build a case for change in terms of what's out there. Um, and you've got that. That's worksheet W and your worksheet handouts. The vision comes back to kind of a, a, a picture of where you want to go. Now that could come from the Beyond Buzzing material for which I've got the 12 Beyond Buzzing principles here for you. Uh, or for budgeting planning, we have lots of different modes of visions. If I'm on the lean accounting side, I can uh, uh, look at practicing lean accounting or some of those materials. So like, I can say, what would move us to right there? Essentially, you're trying to paint a vision of where you're trying to get to. My vision for FPNA is to get off the back of the boat, get away from the scorekeeping that's back out there, and instead get, get up and move forward in terms of being able to help those operations and help move forward in terms of what's out there. Ultimately, we're trying to move toward a, a uh, continuous planning approach in terms of where we're always looking at this, always moving forward. So you paint your vision of where this is going, what, what's going to make this better. And then you focus on the last two, the getting started and the first steps, you know, where do I need to get to? Now, I've got a worksheet in there where you, I mean, it, it, it's important to understand you don't have to have everything figured out to start moving. You just have to have enough confidence that you're going the right direction. You've got to have the first steps figured out to begin to move you into a better place in terms of where you're trying to get to and, and where you're headed in terms of taking those first steps and moving that. Now, we've got worksheet F that's in your handout package there. Um, which is basically just a simple worksheet to kind of start with the first known steps in terms of what's out there. And we can talk about that more. I just want to make sure we've got enough time here. We've got about 10 minutes left here. Um, so it's important to kind of get started uh, in, in terms of you know, getting that. Has you guys actually worked with that? Be sure and give me a call and I'll help talk you through the first steps of different things in terms of what you can do to continue to educate yourself. Um, uh, Craig, if you're, um, I'm sorry, Kyle, if you're, if you're a subdivision of a bigger corporation, we've got other members who are in the same situation, so we can talk you through what you do if you're not, if you're not the whole of the organization. There's different strategies to use to get started within a, a bigger organization. The last part, go ahead. No, I was just saying, okay. Okay. The last part there is the resistance to change. And everybody often ignores this, but this is often one of the most important parts out there. Uh, and I can emphasize, Mauer's got a lot of really, really great stuff on change and change enablement. One of the most important things he talks to us about is the three levels of change. The first level of change, the first resistance you're going to get out there is, is, I don't understand the change. This is logical resistance. And it usually is the kind that you'll see most prevalent. People will say, Hey, I, I just don't understand that. Explain it to me. After you've explained it to them two or three times, it's pretty much, you know, you've kind of broken through that and you're beginning to get into kind of level two. Level two is really better described as I don't like the change is what they'll say. What they're really expressing is an emotional problem with it. I don't like what it's going to do. I mean, I, I used to be the budget manager, so I had a lot of power and you're taking, I'm worried that you're taking away that power. I don't like it because I'm going to have to do things differently and I like my old job. Uh, I don't like it because I don't know what it means to me. So once you get to that emotional level, you'll never solve emotional level change, level two, by giving level one answers. You can keep explaining and explaining and explaining, but it's not logical that they're that they're resisting against is the emotional. And the only way to deal with that, you got to talk about that. Level three also shows up, which is the most pervasive problem that you've got is it's not I don't like the change or, or I, I don't understand the change or I don't like the change. In many cases, some people don't like you. And that evidence is level three levels or trust issues. Now, if you're in an organization where different parts of the organization don't trust each other, or if you're in the field and you don't trust corporate, um, you gotta, you got, if you've got trust issues, you can work around a problem, but until you come back and deal with those trust issues, you won't get change happening in terms of what's out there. So again, I lay those out there so you can be aware of them and, and tackle them as you, as you think through kind of what's out there. 
um, it's real important to, to know which kind of level that you're dealing with and, and address it appropriately. So we've got worksheet R, which is what resistance are you expecting? If you were going to go to a more proactive planning process, who do you think might resist against that? Um, and what level of resistance might you think that would take? In many cases, a lot of organizations resist changes just because they're, you know, they're, they've had so many of them that they're, that they're, they just don't think it's going to, going to go anywhere. And so it's important when you're laying out your initial plans that you think about how you drill that. It's also important when you think about it is, you know, who your allies would be. Where can you get unexpected sources of energy to help pull you forward and help, uh, help bring you up through that in terms of what's out there? Uh, because those unexpected portions of energy can, can really be what sustain you and kind of take you forward. So let me share with you a couple of resources and then we'll, we'll talk through some questions you guys have. Um, if you need more information, I book Future Ready, you know, how to master business forecasting goes into the design principles of forecasting and helps you tackle that. I'd also like you to uh, invite you to join us for any kind of additional coaching. You can drop a line to Robin. She'll, uh, Robin at theplayergroup.com. She can let you know about the training, the coaching that we have. Or if anything else comes up, feel free to call me or talk to me personally, either by, by phone or by email. Either one would be happy to kind of talk you through this. Um, the Lean Accounting Summit is something that Tom Johnson invited me to. Uh, he, he put a bug in Jim's ear that they got me involved with this. It's been a great group, and so I've always enjoyed my, my uh, uh, working with that group, and I'm eager to support you, know, you guys and what you're trying to do because it, it's moving toward fixing the broken parts of finance that are structurally broken. And that's what we're really all trying to do. The book I said, Future Ready, it's out there and, uh, and available to you in terms of what's out there. And then if you need more, we got a whole lot more things on change and things that are out there. These are things that are in the back of your deck there for you to, to take a look at and be happy to talk you through any of those. Um, let's jump over and what questions do you guys have? We could, we're going to go back. Uh, I'm going to come out of the presentation and jump back into the group there so you guys can unmute and we can have a frank conversation. What what else do you want me to answer? Well, you, you kind of know that we're part of a larger organization. Mm -hmm. We're a healthcare system with a hospital and a large multi-specialty physician group. So you know, our corporation is deeply embedded in the traditional budgeting and it's used mainly to try to force us into where they want us to be. Um, From a cost point of view, revenue point of view, or what, I mean, what's the parameters of where they want you to be? All of the above. The okay. margin, you know, so it can be revenue, can be cost, um, but there's so many variables and then you have something like COVID that comes in and it blows up everything. So that would be my question is, man, how do you plan out in the future when you're using what you think are reasonable assumptions for inflation or whatever? Uh, and you know that from based on history that there's a lot of variability in that stuff, you know. Yeah, yeah. Well, one of the ways we tackle a lot of the just pure uncertainty out there in the pandemic was, was at the time was certainly a possibility, but a high uncertainty is we, in addition to having kind of the basic of what we think is going to happen, which you, you cover with kind of rolling forecast, then you ask yourself the question of what uncertainties are out there. What, what things would we need to have scenario plans that would enable us to move faster in terms of what's out there? So you, you plan for kind of any kind of what big things could happen that we'd need to have very rapid reaction plans for. Um, and what, a, what, a, what scenario plans do is it, it, it doesn't give you any better ability to predict, but what it does is, is, is carve out some time to think through if that happened, what would we do about it? And so you build contingent action plans that says, okay, if this happens, it's going to require this kind of response. What things could we do? What plays could we run that would provide those kinds of responses? And what you find, Kyle, is you build those different scenario plans, the process of thinking through what something requires and what your action plans would do, it's like a ball team working on a set of plays. 
I may get into a new game experience and I, I run into a, to something I haven't thought of. It's not in our scenarios, but I immediately can see from what's happening, it's going to require us to be, become more liquid. It's going to require us to, you know, be more agile. And because I fought through the three other scenarios that required those same things, I have a set of plays that we develop for those that I can plug those plays in and very much more rapidly, you know, develop a, a, an action plan for in terms of what's out there. Um, the, the challenge in healthcare, frankly, is just trying to understand where you are in competitive position and, and, and kind of just working through what is a, a, you know, a difficult business uh, in terms of what's out there. There are some companies that are doing very, very well in healthcare, but they tend to be identified by a set of criteria uh, where they have a fairly large market share and they have more of a, uh, an appearance. And so uh, where I can point you to different people and, and show you kind of the things that they're doing, that doesn't guarantee sometimes that you're, 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 the actual state that you're in allows you to do the same kind of thing. So I, I don't want to be presumptuous and assume that you can run the same place somebody else is running simply because they, uh, you know, they're, they're doing them and they're doing them well. So, but it, it's, it's being more, it's thinking through things more proactively in terms of what's out there than, than kind of managing by the, if you think about it, if I had a good rolling forecast and it told me everything about what we were doing, I wouldn't need a budget. I could basically have that role and I could just, whenever it came budget submission time, I could take my latest rolling forecast that this is our best guess of where we are right now because it would be up to date and, and based on all the assumptions out there. But I said, here's the, yeah, anyway, I could say here are the four drivers that are really driving us when these change, how we, how we have to react is going to change right there with it. So how far out do you go on the forecast? Typically, I, I, you know, I, I like to go out in terms of the hard forecast as far as the people can really see. And unfortunately, you'll find that's not that far. Mechanically, once I've kind of gone, I've got, I've got the hard forecast, and then mechanically, I like to go out at least 18 months so I can see, you know, kind of, I, I want to be out far enough so I can see things that hit us and know how fast we can change. Uh, because being out that far, is, I'm not trying to perfectly predict that. I'm trying to I'm trying to understand, you know, how quickly we can adjust for whatever's coming at us. If it a big challenge you may have is okay, if I got to find new doctors, how fast can I find new doctors? Um, and, and and doing forecasting and understanding how those lead times are sometimes it's, it's real critical to to just see how much how much anticipation that I have to put into things. Right. Yeah. Okay. But we're seeing, it, you know, we're seeing that kind of all over the board. Um, the short term, when I think about short term, when I think about the, you know, the three to six month forecast, that's really more like a demand plan kind of thing. It's really in three to six months, there's not a whole lot I can do to change things. You know, I'm, I'm basically adjusting to kind of whatever hits us, how are we going to deal with it? We're, we're, what's our capacity to deal with urgent things in terms of what's out there? The longer lead time I give myself, the more I can be proactive about, you know, finding new ways to tackle things. Well, I've got a, 